At Capella University, you're in control of your education. With the game-changing FlexPath format, you can set your own deadlines and move at your own pace. The faster you move, the more you save. Visit capella.edu to learn more. I don't know what most white people in this country feel. I can only include what they feel from the state of their institutions. Now, this is the evidence. You want me to make an act of faith, risking myself, my wife, my woman, my sister, my children, on some idealism which you assure me exists in America, which I have never seen. Welcome to Black History for White People, a podcast where we educate, resource, and challenge white people about black history. I'm Brad, and on today's show are my co-hosts, Katina and Garen. And we're also joined by Adam Griffin, who's a pastor at Eastside Community Church in East Dallas and has an educational background studying the historical context of racial division in Dallas. Today's topic is East Dallas. This is part two, so if you haven't listened to part one, make sure to go back and take a listen. In this episode, Adam continues to drive around with us and take us all over East Dallas, and we begin this episode discussing Deep Ellum, and we later head to Griggs Park, talk some more history of the city, and we end the ride with a visit to the Freedman Cemetery in Dallas. Garen walks around and reads several plaques and monuments with inscriptions out loud so you can really feel the weight and significance of one of the largest Freedman cemeteries in the country. We hope you enjoy the discussion. I want to talk a little bit about Deep Ellum. Deep Ellum was... A neighborhood famous for kind of its its proximity to downtown. It was where a lot of the cotton from the farms in the area would be brought in and ginned and, and sent out again on the on the Central Railroad track. Sometimes people call Deep Ellum Central Track because the Central Railroad track came right down the middle of one of the neighborhoods there. But it was a neighborhood of a lot of African Americans and a lot of Jews, who, uh, Jewish people who lived in that neighborhood. Uh, and so it became kind of a historic cultural center as well so if you looked up kind of where in the city of dallas was the the nightlife for those people who were not white that was going to be deep ellum and it's maintained that reputation ever since so it was a center of of blues music there's a lot of historic hotels down there it was also the center of life for a lot of african-american residents for dallas so there's a building down there that's now called the Pittman motel and it was designed by Mr. Pittman. It used to be the Pythias, uh, uh, Knights of Pythias Temple. And that's where like the barbershop was. That's where the, uh, that's where graduation would happen for Dallas Colored High School. That's where the first uh, African-American doctors and first African-American dentists, all of them were in the Pythias Temple. And that building is still there. It was designed by Mr. Pittman, who was the son-in-law of Booker T. Washington. So. It was, uh, he was a resident here, got to design that building, and it's uh, now the Pittman Motel. So there, it's kind of a historic building, but again, a lot of people don't know about its cool history. Wow. Um, but it's, a, it's one of those buildings you can drive by, you can see, you can learn about it. And Deep Ellum was the center also for theater at the time. And of course, theaters were also segregated. One of the biggest uh, African-American movie makers of, of silent film, uh, he had an office down here. He didn't. He didn't produce down here. It wasn't his central place, but he had an office down here at at Fat Jack's Theater. It was called the the Grand Theater, and that's uh, all of that for the most part has been destroyed since then because of the building of highways in the area. So when wow. highways got built, they they tore right through what was Deep Ellum Central Track. It was also, though, one other interesting thing about the neighborhood. It's where St. Paul's, um, which was a Catholic hospital, was built. Uh, St. Paul's Sanitarium. Now in that same neighborhood is Baylor, Baylor Downtown, which is a huge hospital. Well, Baylor is a, a Baptist hospital. It was built in response to the Catholics building their hospital. But one of the things that St. Paul Hospital did that um, is of interest to our audience probably is that they were the first hospital in Dallas to admit African-American physicians. So in 1954... They brought in five African-American physicians who were then allowed to see African-American clients and patients. It was still segregated, again, by the public, but it's the first hospital in the city to do so. And Dallas did that before Chicago, did it before a lot of other major cities. So there were a few uh, African-American physicians who moved to Dallas then to be a part of it. Uh, One of the more famous uh, famous physicians there was Dr. Lee Gresham Pinkston, who before that moment, he had ran his own clinic. It was actually the only hospital in Dallas for African-Americans from 1928 to 1954. And it was just a 15-bed 
house. I mean, basically, you just came in and he would perform surgeries or procedures there in what was called at the time Short North Dallas or North Dallas. It was the, a major Freedman town, which now is modern day Uptown and 75 and some other freeways. But at the time was kind of this big cultural center. So Deep Ellum and what's now Uptown originally before they gentrified, I'm sure you guys have talked a lot about gentrification and and how that works. But before that, those were the those were the kind of the centers of culture and residency for the, the African-American population in Dallas, the, the largest amount of them. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Lee Pinkston actually also owned a flower shop that was one of the places that was bombed by uh, by the kind of terrorism in the area of uh, trying to get uh, African-Americans to be afraid and to move out. Intimidation, yeah. Exactly, to be intimidated out of their homes. And by the way, there was never a single arrest made in any investigations Absolutely. for any of the bombings that happened in people's homes. But he was a pioneering doctor in the area. Uh, and it wasn't for years and years later before any other hospital admitted African-American physicians or that they we're able to see this is where we're coming back to here in a little bit so how has the city celebrated him i don't know i don't or know that there's they? anything named after after uh after dr pinkston uh -huh. i don't know so the park we're pulling up to now is in uptown this is like a a very upper class very white neighborhood a lot of young professionals live here yep but back in the day this was this was Short North Dallas or North Dallas or it was it was a Freedman town, and we're, right now what we're pulling off of is 75, which is it follows Central Track, but is much wider than a railroad. And so when they expanded this highway, it may, had a huge impact on the Freedman town that was here. But I want to talk a little bit about Griggs and, and some of the other um, pioneers here uh, as we pull up to his park. But one thing I want to mention before that also in this area was Dallas Colored High School, the original, what became Booker T. Washington when it moved downtown. But Dallas, Dallas Colored High School had one of the first, if not the first, high school football teams for African Americans in Dallas. And at the time uh, when that school started, football was a big sport, but it was also segregated. So in order for these kids to play football, they would have to drive hundreds of miles, sometimes overnight, in order to get a football game. Wow. And they played on Thursdays instead of Friday. So everybody knows Friday night lights in Texas. Yeah. African-American teams played on Thursday night on the same fields because they had to remain segregated. So these players would have to drive hundreds of miles on a school night to go play a game and then drive back. One of my favorite pictures, and I'll try to give this to you guys for your, uh, your show notes, is a picture of that first high school African-American football team from the 20s, the Bulldogs of what eventually was Booker T. Washington, which at the time was Dallas Colored High School. Wow. And there was a, a lot of pride in that team, but it wasn't until the 60s before what is now the UIL, which oversees sports, before it began to integrate. Before that, they had the Prairie View uh, Interscholastic League, which was the African-American League, which basically meant like uh, a team in Fort Worth, a team in Dallas, a team in Austin. And they'd have to travel to play each other. And some of these high school teams would even play college, uh, historically African-American colleges yep. instead of playing other high school teams because that's what they had to do in order to fill out a season. Well, it's interesting to note, so then that they would be driving maybe, you know, several miles, hundreds of miles to go play a game. Yep. But then on, on traveling um, was dangerous, especially large groups of black people. Mm. So just imagine the encounters many of them must have had, like many teams must have had dealing with racism, being pulled over. Um, I, I, I just can't imagine. No, I can't imagine. Okay, so the park we pulled up right now is named after Reverend Alan R. Griggs. This is, I mentioned earlier when we talk about segregated swimming, this was Hall Street Negro Park. Mm -hmm. This was in the middle of the Freedman Town. So this is where there used to be a pool, which was the only place for segregated swimming for African-American kids. And then when uh, it was gentrified and became Uptown, they, they obviously renamed it from Hall Street Negro Park to Griggs Park to be named after Reverend Griggs. And he's an important figure in some of the changes. He started the first high school for African-Americans, the first newspaper for African-Americans. He started the first church in Dallas for African-Americans. He was a pastor of New Hope Baptist Church, which started as like a 20 by 30 foot box house when he was 20, 25 years old. And he raised some money. He cooperated a lot with Mr. Buckner, who started Buckner International, that does a lot of foster care and adoption, to start the first uh, foster and adoption center for African-Americans. 
He's just the quintessential guy who looked around and said, why don't we have anything like this for our people? Right. When there are so many, so many things out there for the whites in our community that, to be able to find and be adopted, to, to take care of those kids who didn't have parents, to have a newspaper that would share what is happening in our community, to have a school. He started uh, one of the first African-American colleges uh, in 1903, he, he used to write for the Dallas Morning News as well. One of the things he said is wow. the the sooner all of the colored people and white people can understand each other and settle down upon the eternal principles of truth and righteousness as found in the Bible, respecting our duty towards each other, peace, happiness, and prosperity will pervade the country. He was, he was a, a, a reconciler. He was seeking for change. And you can even read an account in 1884 where more than 5,000 people had gathered, black and white, to witness a public hanging. And he stood up in the midst of those 5,000 people and admonished them. And it says that those 5,000 people dispersed, heads bowed, hats in hand, tears in many eyes, no longer interested in the sad spectacle. He's just a great example of a brave man that now a park is named after, but many people don't remember him. And he wrote for the Dallas, Dallas Morning News, yeah. <clears throat> At the time it was called the Dallas Herald, I think. That is... There's several guys in this area, including Professor Harley, who was the first coach and principal at Dallas Colored High School. He wrote a regular column for, uh, is pointed at African-American youth. And if you go to the Dallas Morning News archives, you can read some of the things he's just trying to encourage them in as, as far as how to be uh, brave, how to pursue the degree and the career you want. He, Harley is a really interesting personal case too. He was uh, born into slavery. Uh, was illiterate, taught himself to read, and then went on to be a professor at teaching thousands of other people to read. Wow. He, was, he also oversaw part of the state fair. If you ever want to cover the history of the state fair and the lack of integration there, it's also pretty interesting. But you can see, even see right now as we look around, there's just it's a mostly white, affluent neighborhood. And I don't know what the awareness is, but I could assume of who is Pastor Griggs and what's the work he did. But there is one memorial I want to give you guys a chance to see out here to, to Reverend Griggs that we'll walk out and see. Uh, let me tell you about one more family, though, before we do that. One of the other families uh, that was prominent in the African-American community right after Reverend Griggs was the Jackson family. And that was Alexander Jackson. He was the pastor of New Hope after Griggs. And New Hope was like right across the street, right around the same corner as this park, as the Dallas Colored High School. We're, we're sitting in the middle of what was the African-American community in the early 1900s. And he wrote an optimistic projection for race relations in 1920 called The Rebirth of Negro Ideals, where he talked about how churches here were so segregated and how how cowardly white pastors were to even mention race or talk about how the Bible talked about it. Here's, wow. I'll just read you a little bit of the quote from this, what he said in 1920, which to me, other than some of the maybe nomenclature uh, in it, it could have just as easily, easily been written this week. He said in 1920, black people thought that many white pastors were cowards in their own pulpits in the treatment of racial questions. They pay the utmost respect to wrong public opinion and do their work more in fear of their people than in fear of God. Wow. And so do not contribute to the Christian solution of the problems we have between races. They make little to no effort to mold a right public sentiment. If the men of God of both races who are the religious leaders could earnestly cooperate to point their respective peoples and all the people to the ways of righteousness, the interracial situation in ex-slave territory would be a great deal different, a vast deal better. White Christianity in the South is having small influence over the Negro population here because the great majority of the race cannot see Christ in the attitude and the spirit of the preachers and the churches of the white people who seem to dare not rebuke wrongly or openly when Negroes needlessly suffer from outrages against them. Wow. And like I said, you could just as easily read that today. His son, uh, grew, uh, Maynard Jackson Sr., grew up to lead a political movement in the city of Dallas to make the African-American community a block of voters that made local politicians pay attention to them. Before that, I mean, it was, you were the minority, so you didn't get what you wanted at any vote. And he said, well, we're going to start voting together. And he made politicians start to pay attention to them. And then his son, Maynard Jackson Jr., went on to be the first black mayor of Atlanta. And yep. there's a whole documentary about Maynard Jackson Jr. and how he grew up in this home that advocated for their people. In fact, I think his mom was the first African-American woman to get a library card in Atlanta. And that was her own personal fight. They were, yeah. they were, they were very interested in not putting up with the status quo yeah. uh, and seeing things change for the better for their people.
That is awesome. Well, let's, uh, you guys want to hop out for a minute? We'll look at the, the obelisk they put up for Reverend Griggs, and then we'll, we'll uh, talk about some pretty big deals yep. for our last spot. Tells a little bit of the history as you go around, both about him and who it's named after, as well as what used to be here. It's just a memorial to the fact that this used to be a freed slave area. Freed, uh, the enslaved people that lived here had a freedman's town. And now, if you look at an old map, the highways bisected it. Everything was turned over, and it really kind of destroyed the continuity of the neighborhood when they built the highways, which we'll talk about more here in a second. That's what. That's the next thing we're going to talk about. The history of the highways is really seedy. And even it said that oh, one and a half acres was sold. It's like, sure, was it like sold or was it? It was taken? sold. They used such like kind of neutral like, were language. Highways constructed or were highway, they, like, Yeah, the highways you know I mean? deliberately the way targeted. That this is worded. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 kind of whitewashed, or watered down. Of it's course just, it is. The language is made kind of passive Sanitized. and neutral. Yeah. yeah. At Capella University, education is as smart as the world around us. With the FlexPath format, you can take classes at your own pace, set your own deadlines, and even leverage your previous experience to move faster. Now that's smart. Learn more at capella.edu. Oh, that says he passed away in 1922. Yeah. The thing I said, 1920. that he was buried in 1920, I don't know which one's right. So this used to all, I mean, this, the highway right there cuts through right was the middle of the neighborhood. This was their one park. Wow. And now everything's different. And this is all a gentrified uptown. Of course. This also used to be, I know this isn't part of your podcast, but Little Mexico was like two blocks that way, which was the large Hispanic population that was in Dallas at the time. They started living in railroad cars, which this was the, wow. the railroad right here. And then they moved over here and built like a whole cultural center. It was like Little Mexico. It was real Little Mexico, but so much of our now history it's is intertwined. So, you know, you can't. You talk about Black history. You can't talk about Black history without in, in America without talking about Indigenous peoples, yeah. Native American Indian history. You can't. And then, of course, Mexican, specifically in Texas. You know, Latin, eggs, yeah. Hispanic cultures, and of course, Asian cultures like it's so, so a lot of it there, there is intersectionality so for sure you know what's great like native american history because of the reservation system we put them on the Caddo people who lived here now they have a spot in oklahoma yeah. you know it's like a reservation that we gave them somewhere else mm -hmm. so then you go generation by generation by generation who remembers anything about Dallas area. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but some like 80 to 90 percent were wiped out by disease. Mm -hmm. And then on yep. top of that violence, mm -hmm. and you go, the whole population was decimated. Yeah. Okay, so automobiles first come to Dallas in about the, in about 1900 when the speed limit in Dallas was seven miles per hour. Wow. Uh, nowadays, 85 percent of people drive for work. But back in the day, they used to have like little trucks, little buses, railroad cars, mules. That's how people would get back and forth. And, and things were smaller at the time as well. But with the onset of the automobile came this drive, especially from the suburbs to build highways, which was a convenient way for people who didn't live in the city to get to downtown. People who wanted to be separate to still come into downtown. Right. And uh, we've talked about this a little bit, but the, the history of the highways in pretty much any city is going to be one of eminent domain claiming land from those people who didn't have the power to say anything different. It, it's what they called slum clearance, which is, is a nice way of saying the poor people had to find somewhere else to live. And uh, wow. it, it caused a lot of issues. But I could talk a lot about the different highways. Let me tell you a little bit about two specific ones. One is I-30, which is kind of the southern border of what we're looking through, uh, looking at uh, as we're traveling around together. But I-30 is also known as... Um, R.L. Thornton Freeway. It's named after a former mayor, but R.L. Thornton is also, uh, was a prominent member of the KKK. Yep. And so this highway, R.L. Thornton Freeway, is named after a prominent KKK member, which is one of the issues we have in a lot of American cities is what are we honoring and who are we honoring when you name things after people that had notorious connections with discrimination, and be it... 
And why? Yeah, so Dallas was actually the number one city for the KKK in the 1920s. Yep. About two-thirds of the police department in Dallas were Ku Klux Klan members in the 1920s. Two-thirds? Two-thirds. When you look at the number of eligible men, so that's white men who are maybe non-Catholic, who lived in Dallas, the percentage of them is enormous. Uh, just as an aside, right now we're passing what was the European Settlers Cemetery. On the other side is a Jewish cemetery. And then we're going to go to the Freedman Cemetery, which is on the far side where the freeway is now in just a second. Wow. So in the 1920s, the Klan had a, a designated whipping meadow, quote unquote, whipping meadow along the Trinity River. They would take African-Americans down to the whipping meadow to beat them and to intimidate them. And historians contest that the Klan profoundly shaped Dallas racial beliefs for decades. So... Even though the KKK is not as visual as it is now, I mean, the, the, the Texas State Fair at Dallas used to have KKK Day, where they would come and they would have a big installation ceremony of their new KKK members. One of our mayors was obviously a KKK member, a very prominent one, and the highway is still named after him. Then the first highway in Dallas is what's called Central Expressway. That's 75. It was the first expressway here, and in the early 1980s, that's kind of when they put it in. So not that long ago, 40 years or so ago. When they opened it, they had a, a huge uh, gathering to celebrate the opening of the first freeway. And even at that, there was a dance afterwards that was segregated. We had a country dance over on one side for the white people that came to celebrate on the highway. And then I think they called it a street dance for the uh, those members of uh, the African-American community who were in the neighborhood. Well, in Texas, you may know this, but it's illegal to build over burial grounds unless those bodies are properly moved. And they knew there had been a Freedman Cemetery right where they wanted to put the freeway, but they thought it was a couple dozen bodies. And when they started to do construction, they realized it was thousands and thousands of freed slaves who had been buried there. And there's a reason, uh, similar to what we talked about at the McCree Cemetery, that their graves were unmarked, unnoticed, or vandalized. And so they... They found uh, 1,500 or so graves that they had to move and give proper reburials. And so when we see 75, you're driving over. When you drive through the middle of Dallas, you're driving over what was somebody's cemetery, what was somebody's funeral, what was sacred space for somebody. It's not just what was formerly their neighborhood. It was actually uh, something uh, significant to the community uh, that meant uh, something special where you would go to remember your relatives. And now instead of that, it's a freeway, it's paved. And so because of that, one of the, I think the most uh, precious and important places to visit when you're doing African-American history work in Dallas is the Freedman Cemetery Memorial. And when you walk into the Freedman Cemetery Memorial, it is a powerful experience. There is a, a statue of a, a female African woman called a griot or a storyteller representing the history to be kept alive and then a male African warrior representing the protecting of the cemetery. Mm -hmm. And on the inside of the entryway, like for when you're leaving, you see them depicted as they were in America where uh, the female figure is called the, the violated soul. Her wrists and feet are bound in iron. And then the man is called the struggling soul. Similarly shown with his wrists and his feet bound and these they're provocative, powerful statues, full size. And in the, in the middle of this uh, open space with no, un with no marked graves, it's just thousands and thousands of unmarked graves of freed slaves from this freedman town, there's a, a central statue as well called the Dream of Freedom. And it's incredibly moving. It, it's a, it depicts a man sitting on a stump whose back is scarred with whips. And it's a testament to the memorial and, and the beauty of the space, but that the, the, the possibility of freedom was in some ways just as sweet and just as bitter as the slavery that had been endured. And so the Freedman Memorial, I want to take us in there as a podcast team, give you guys a little bit of a chance to reflect and then maybe talk about some of the things that you've seen. So we're going to turn right, right here. Yep. Here. But again, you can see that the, the African American cemetery was closest to the railroad track, it was kind of the, the least wanted land. This is a space we usually, when we do our tour, this is our last stop. And we just give people like freedom to hang out, walk around inside, and then come back and we process together. The thoughts we got. You'll see, like I told you, like if you see the, the front side is the proud African storyteller, the back side is the enslaved woman. The proud side, 
the outside is the warrior, the inside is the enslaved man. And so you can, if you want to take a couple minutes and kind of read some of the things yeah. they've got posted, and maybe give yourself a, some time to walk around, and then. A life to celebrate. Sweet sounding voices of our ancestors cry, O oh, little black children, our own, please hear. So you may know the weary filled years which set you here. Hope could not pass you by. This life was hard, so you, child, would apply to enjoy life, those things we hold so dear. Not simply to toil, struggle, and to fear. Offspring, learn now the road we had to buy. Our spirits strong, living like rising air. Proud, intelligent you are, and you are. Celebrating life to show you care. Never forget your past, these souls martyred. For no one is promised sweet, life is fair. But unto all, the duty is to falter never. Remel Derrick. 1995. A thread of freedom. Opening the drawer to remove fresh cloth, the stench of neglect invades pure air, the fabric worn from the work of a moth, the texture haggard, both from time and wear, the history which lives with each thread strong, every stitch brought together by brave souls, congregated to fight against life's wrongs, they came from both sexes, the young and old. I unfold the quilt to inhale beauty. Different colors are combined with each other. The pass down from the pass down from those who value hard work and duty and would light and would not live property of another. Our inherited freedom, life's treasure, simply belongs to all without measure. Lisbeth Musselwhite, 1995. Remembrance. The moment once here, as of now bereft, so many lives, all one by one taken, though not so sad place, for though this unfair theft, they in God's glorious land will awaken. Most now are gone, yet hardly forgotten. These treasured ancestors must live on in our spirits we remain ever begotten and we shall never from them find ourselves gone so much like a precious family heirloom passed down through many generations never to be lost or forgotten too soon yet to help us achieve our expectations we implore please know this is no more so fact their dignity is returned to us at last Olivia Lynn, 1995. Near this place, near here sleep now dead. Though are they so cold, let it be known here warm beneath resided in these lungs under tragic struggle bold. Steps these walked, yet their past was abided. These simple lives unknown until now face here new meaning and are not in vain. With death near, so much knowledge buried, how many secrets are buried in these lives unchained. Yet lived, yet lived these, lived boldly so and endured, yet new pain, yet new pain, humanity they preserved, yet new pain, humanity they preserved, as hate trod on and true knowledge obscured, while here dignity is kept, is honored. This, never a cold vault of gloom, but here is peace and a debt paid. This is now near. Jedediah Anderson, 1995. Undying love. Black people, your mind's not fixed on grieving, yet to feel so much pain for so much time. Many a soul wrecked, soon flees peace of mind. This hateful world still now deceitful. You toiled through sweat, suffering, but believing. Sometimes too hot, the sun above did shine. Painful hearts pray for all to be fine. Images of departure enticing. Spirits wandering through all the... <clears throat> Spirits wandering through all those sad years laid down a path for others. Much like me, free, you strive to cleanse all the salty tears. 
working so that we would ever be free. Your dearest love that comforts all earthly fears is reborn in this undying, watchful tree. Summer Allen. Eulogy to an unknown freedman. We transient men of clay can well attest to the inherited frailty of the human frame and do likewise confess that most of our names are inevitably reduced to whispering ashes of fond recollections, scattering before the breath of the night wind that blows out of the twilight of our day. However, unlike this freedman, we can draw comfort from our nostalgic predilection to leave our mortal names engraved in stone upon the sod. While he could only cling to the clarity of his perception that his name had been inscribed in the mind of God, Though anonymous here, the past deeds of this seemingly lost life of sorrows still impact on our today and our tomorrows, for the complex fabric of our times is thickly interwoven with the sturdy cotton threads he spun upon his wheel of life. Yes, we've heard this freedman, this motherless child of Africa, here in this solemn place our dead stir from ancient chains rattle, dusty memories then resettle, as stones unfolded deeds of gallantry, bold, are whispered, one with pleas, one with pleas of freedom, fortified, so silent, no more, they beckon offering response to queries posed centuries ago, here, on this surreal playground, Our children spent carefree eves in dance, an ode to the ancestors disguised as play, and beloved spirits waited passively for the call to stop the game, the call that would distinguish each by name, child of mother, sister to one, aunt to another. They bid time here, it is here. The ghostly soldier does battle no more those once held prisoner, now flourishing death's cool parlor. As night convokes day to suppress in the inviting arms ever the assurance of the renewed dawn commands and we, in homecoming, reclaim a noble past in the place, weary from hope lost, now reborn here. We shall harvest all, dare leave no stone undone, Those at once yielding, resistant, and knowing. Dreamers so alone, each one strengthened. By a grave digger's find, every one, heir. To the riches that rival Solomon, to the riches that rival Solomon's minds. As the present tightens itself about our necks, disarmed. Finally now, har- finally now harmless. We discover among these embattled warriors, friend, cousin, brother, no longer buried, but at rest, not buried, but sweet with peace, as life is sown from death here. Nia Kimbo, 1994. There's a description about the poem here. It's a poem created by local poet Nia Kimbo. The back side of the poem platform contains the cemetery's only remaining headstones. The graves connected to those headstones are unknown, and no surviving relatives have been found. Interior wall and fence columns contain children's poems selected from a Dallas public school's poetry competition themed on Friedman Cemetery. The children's poems represent the future. Eulogy to an Unknown Friedman is a poem by Ramona Newton. There's a description plaque at the Freedman Cemetery that says, This area of Dallas County was settled by former African-American slaves shortly after the conclusion of the American Civil War. Freedman Cemetery, a graveyard for African-Americans, was established in 1869 on one acre of land purchased by trustee Sam Eakins. Another three acres was acquired for cemetery purposes in 1879 by trustee A. Willett Frank Reed. A. Boyd T. Watson, George English, Silas Pittman, and the Reverend 
A.R. Griggs, a former slave who later became a prominent local church leader and champion of early public education for the African American community. The community of churches, commercial enterprises, and residences that had developed in this area by the turn of the 20th century was by 1912 a part of the city of Dallas. Construction of the Central Expressway through here in the 1930s virtually eliminated all physical above-ground reminders of the cemetery. Descendants of persons buried here and the city of Dallas agreed in 1965 to establish the Freedmen's Memorial Park and Cemetery. At this site, beginning in 1989, representatives of the community worked with the city of Dallas and the Texas Department of Transportation to preserve the historic Freedman Cemetery site prior to highway expansion. When we get off here at Mockingbird, you're going to see, I'll point out to you a big uh, Dr. Pepper sign. This used to be the, the headquarters of Dr. Pepper, the soda that we all know and love. Uh, was right here at Mockingbird at 75. Well, when it was built there, this highway was not here. And to our left, to our west, is, is Highland Park in the Park City. So this is a very white suburb. And uh, it's in the city, but it's, it's its own enclave with its own police department, its own school system. And, and the first um, non-white homeowner was in 2003. I mean, it's oh, it's wow. been white for a long time. And when they were first looking to build this Dr. Pepper headquarters and bottling plant, you're going to turn right on Mockingbird. Uh, the neighborhood did not want it. So right here is SMU, the Park Cities. The neighborhood was like, no, that's going to bring down our um, our property values. Well, the Carruth family, who's one of the wealthiest historic Dallas families, they were they owned enslaved people back in the day. They they had farms here. They uh, the the streets around here are named after them. Well, they owned this property and wanted to sell it to Dr. Pepper. So he told the Park Cities, if you won't let me sell this property to Dr. Pepper, then I'm going to sell it to what he called a Negro colony, and that will be built here instead. And so they acquiesced and said, okay, we'd rather have a Dr. Pepper uh, bottling center wow. than have to live next door to people who didn't look like us. Wow. It reminds me of a couple other stories. There's, there's one I had read recently where there was a, a all-white community that was segregated and white and there was a uh, like a mental hospital on the like in the community yeah that was used for convicted pedophiles and uh was all white so all white convicted pedophiles wow. and there was no community pushback against it um the, no petitions against it or anything and then at some point the uh facility was sold to a uh, a, a different organization that was going to build a an integrated home for veterans that was going to have both black and white veterans and all of a sudden there was this is the Dr. Pepper sign right here on your left on top of this Kroger sign oh, yeah. this is where it all used to be Dr. Pepper station anyway go ahead I'm sorry for interrupting yeah. wow. um, and all of a sudden there was a huge community outcry and uh, petitions and threats of uh, violence and disturbance in response to uh, like the, the community pushed back more against uh, having black veterans than against having uh, white, pedophiles. Uh, white pedophiles. Wow. Convicted. White Convicted, pedophiles. yeah. Uh, this right here in our right, you'll see is Mockingbird Elementary School. Uh, two years or er, four years ago, that was Stonewall Jackson Elementary School. So that's one of the schools that got renamed. Oh, cool from uh, kind of celebrating a uh, Confederate general to being a community school. And there's a lot of schools like that in Dallas and in many cities that have been renamed. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if we'll use it or not, but uh, do you want to tell any of the stories of you, you alluded to earlier with the lynchings that happened in Dallas? Sure, yeah. Some of the more prominent stories that are in Dallas's racial history that didn't happen on this side of town. One of them, is, probably the most famous, is the lynching of Alan Brooks. And Alan was accused of a, a heinous crime against a white person. But before he even got to trial, there was a, a raiding of what is now the old red museum. It's a, it's a museum to Dallas history, but at the time was the county courthouse in Dallas. And he was dragged out of a second story window and hung from a pole in the middle of the street and hundreds and hundreds of people gather around to watch and celebrate and there's actually an iconic postcard that was sold to commemorate the lynching of Alan Brooks. Just terrible and 
Uh, there are some commemorative activities that'll happen where you can uh, walk from the, the window that he was dragged from to the place that he was hung from an arch and, and to commemorate that. Uh, that's that's in downtown Dallas. One of the other most famous incidents that, no, well, I shouldn't say famous. Most people don't know about it. Uh, people know about the Chicago fire. People know about other major fires. But there was a, a fire in Dallas in the 1800s that pretty much destroyed the city, destroyed a huge percentage of it. And it, although there was no evidence for it, it was blamed on uh, the enslaved people having a slave uprising. So they were accused. And with uh, no evidence. In fact, the, the judge said there's, uh, I forget the exact quote, but something along the lines of there's nothing in here to convict these people. But they took three uh, three men who were known to be kind of um, rabble rousers. They weren't the most obedient enslaved men that anybody knew. They took those three and they killed them. And then they took every, every enslaved person in Dallas County and whipped them in... Uh, in this one little field in the middle of downtown in order to teach them a lesson never to rise up again. What's crazy is it, it, it might not have been an uprising in the first place. This is a fire that could have started any number of ways, but it gives you an idea of the mindset at the time of the fear in the white population of what if there was an uprising. We um, talked about that um, in the last episode, the Biloxi Way, just this fear of they're going to do to us what we've done to them because we know what yeah. we've done to them is heinous. Yeah. And that, and and you know, wh whiteness is still ruled by that fear today. I mean, it's just true. A lot of that, you know, that the motivation for. Um, let me just shut up. What well, a lot of the motivation for keeping political power and not creating a truly pluralistic democracy mm -hmm. uh, is like a. A fear of like, well, we've been unfair. What if black people yeah. make things unfair to make them fair? Right. Well, politics, local politics is another interesting racial topic too. Historically, uh, Dallas had kind of an at-large election. You, uh, Anybody at Dallas can vote and vote for the person they want to be city councilman. Well, what that did is if you're in the minority culture, then uh, your candidates or people you may have wanted or people that represented you were not getting elected because the majority voted in everybody they wanted. And at the time, uh, Dallas was highly influenced and always has been by what will bring the most profit, what do we think is best for business, that did not always have uh, what was best in mind for those who were impoverished or those who were in minority populations. Right. So at some point in the 70s, uh, Dallas switched to what we have now. It's called a weak mayor system, which means the mayor runs the city council meeting, but he's just one more vote in the city council. And then each one of the city councilmen represents a different district within the city. What's good about that is then you have a diverse group of representation from across the city that's supposed to work together in order to re represent the whole. But then the, the, the really difficult part is because there's still so many divides neighborhood by neighborhood, what one neighborhood needs competes against another neighborhood. And so you have a city council that thinks uh, primarily about their neighborhood which that's great. That's awesome. You're representing those people, but then it's so hard for our city to accomplish anything together. That's uh, as compared to New York city that has a strong mayor system where that mayor really, he runs that city like a president. He's, he's in charge. Uh, Dallas, like many cities has a weak mayor system, which means there's a lot of opportunity for cooperation, but it ends up with a lot of conflict as well. All right. All right so Adam, uh, we have probably about 20,000 white listeners that uh, over the course of the next year or so are going to listen to this episode. Um, so I wonder what you would charge them with as maybe some parting or summary thoughts. Um, what would you kind of want to leave them with? That's a great question. I think uh, my, my journey really started as trying to be a, a heavily invested listener, not a, a passive listener. I want to hear stories from other peoples and other people groups, including ones that aren't allowed to, or aren't around to speak for themselves anymore. And so that meant a lot of reading, but it also meant a lot of listening to friends and, and building uh, diverse relationships. And I think it's been really helpful for me. And it's meant a lot to my friends who are not white to show that I really care enough to listen well, study well, read well. I, I had some rules in my life where I, I read a lot of books, but I make sure that always one of the books I'm reading is by a person of color. I think a lot of our white listeners would be surprised at how rarely they're reading somebody or listening to somebody who is not grow up like them or think like them. And so that's been a good challenge for me as well to just think about creating some rules in my life. But I, 
I think as well, there's some of the stuff that I've literally read uh, that if you live in Dallas would be great for you. But whatever city you're from, I bet there's some local history to look into. And I can guarantee if you live in America, some of your local history is related to race. And so in Dallas, there's there's a ton of great books. One is called White Metropolis, which is more uh, academic, but it talks about the history of race and religion in Dallas. There's some uh, s- specific ones. Paved Away is a book just about the highways and the Freedman Cemetery and what difference they've made. Then there's more general Dallas history books, anyone by Darvin Payne or uh, the Dallas Myth that will cover some aspects of race. Uh, the The books that people love the most that are harder to get are The Accommodation, which starts by talking about uh, Dallas politics, but also the bombings and the black housing crisis we talked about. There's books about redlining. There's books more specific like Hamilton Park, uh, Planned Black Neighborhood in Dallas. Uh, But there's also a lot available to you on the internet. Uh, I would start with people, though. Start with trying to build relationships with people who don't look like you without making them into a... um, a tool for you to use in order to be educated, but an actual relationship with somebody you do care about who can help you understand what it's like to grow up different than you are and then look into your own local history and that will help, I think, round out a little bit more of of, uh, your understanding uh, and how it needs to be broadened as a a white person who grew up with a a one version of history that is not necessarily the, the version that a lot of the people in those stories grew up with. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you are looking for more information on what we discuss, take a look at the show notes or go to blackhistoryforwhitepeople.com. If you'd like to play a supportive role in the podcast and be able to vote for future topics, check us out on Patreon at patreon.com backslash blackhistoryforwhitepeople. On our next episode, we will be discussing mass incarceration. We'll leave you with this quote from Toni Morrison. The very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. At Capella University, you're in control of your education. With the game-changing FlexPath format, you can set your own deadlines and move at your own pace. The faster you move, the more you save. Visit capella.edu to learn more.